Good evening, and welcome to the third and final day of KFAS's webinar on marine litter. This webinar series has been a fruit of collaborative efforts between KFAS, CFAS, Kisser, and Kuwait University. I am Dr. Fahd Al-Sanafi from Kuwait University. I am currently chairing this session from the heart of marine education in Kuwait at the Marine Science Center that is part of the Faculty of Science in Kuwait University. As scientists, we have failed in many ways in providing the linkage between science and citizens. This linkage is crucial to help face our environmental challenges. Due to, the, due to, to this importance, the Scientific Committee of the, Marine Science, uh, the, of the Marine Litter webinar series opted to have a day of talks that included, that included citizen science. In today's program, we will have three 20-minute talks followed by two intense five-minute talks on innovative solutions and the role of citizen science. I encourage everyone to ask our speakers questions in the chat where they will be marked and answered in our Q&A panel after the end of today's last talk. To lead today's talk on citizen science, I would like to welcome Dr. Laura Foster. The environment is one of Laura's great passions. She has been working with the, Marine, with the Marine Conservation Society since 2013. Prior to joining the Marine Conservation Society, she worked at a number of institutions across the world, researching the impacts of climate change after gaining her PhD at the University of St. Anne Andrews. Laura decided, decided to leave academia to do something more hands-on. Having worked in the corporate sector, Laura understands the challenges faced in making changes in large companies and organizations. One of her greatest privileges at Marine Conservation Society is to see how, and, uh, is to see how our work impacts and improves the environment and people's lives for the better. The floor is yours, uh, Professor. Thank you very much for that introduction. So uh, good evening um, to everyone there. Thank you very much for joining me. So I'm going to talk through about um, beach clean data and why it's so valuable. So the Marine Conservation Society has a long history of um, gathering beach clean data. So we do a 100 meter survey stretch um, where we ask people to collect all the litter on that and then we ask them to survey. And a question I often get asked is, well, why don't you just clean up? You know, clean up will be a bit faster, etc." And I hope in this presentation, you will begin to see the value of, of doing that survey and why it is so valuable. And I can sort of start forming that image in your mind. If you think about it, if you're talking to someone, uh, talking to a politician, a uh, business, etc., and saying, hey, I went to the beach at the weekend. It was kind of dirty. I saw a few things. It wasn't very nice. You know, people understand the story and, and they're sort of engaged and sort of, you know, might ask you some questions. But if you can sort of say, well, actually, I counted 400 bits of litter over a 100 meter stretch. They're like, wow, that's so much. Like, I can't believe what kind of thing did you find? And then you can go into the detail. And quite often, you know, people go to the beach and sort of say, oh, I didn't realize there was quite this amount of stuff. And, and what does it look like? And what can I do to help? So I think it's incredibly important that we do that. So I hope that, you know, through my presentation, you'll start to understand that story and how we engage. So I appreciate that many of you will have a sort of background and, and know quite a lot about marine litter. Um, so, but I'm just gonna provide a, a very basic kind of introduction. In terms of kind of impacts of marine litter, we can think about those as impacts in terms of entanglement. We can also think about them uh, impacts in terms of ingestion. And those impacts in terms of ingestion can be a physical uh, problem, but it also can be a um, problem due to the chemicals that are found on that bit of plastic. And those can be those from kind of the production, um, plasticizers, et cetera, or those can be chemicals that have been absorbed from the from the ocean itself and we know that you know when people go to the beach you know the last thing they want to see is litter you know that's why you know resorts that own um you know beachside um locations will we'll send out somebody every morning to make sure that their part of the beach is kind of pristine so you know we know that tourists don't like to see that and we also have that kind of impact in terms of kind of uh, upon the fishing industry, either directly through kind of um, catching their nets, um, dragging onto their nets, 
or it can be indirect through actually the contamination of actually the, the seafood uh, shellfish etc that is eaten and we know that that um, you know happens you know it's estimated around 1800 bits of microplastics are ingested if you're a seafood eater every year so we've kind of become familiar with these kind of uh, images, you know, um, seabird ingesting sort of plastics. But how did we actually get here? Well, a lot of that is related to uh, this image you can see from Life magazine um, that was published in 1955. And it talked about the fact that single use plastics um, was actually going to solve a problem you know it was going to be great you know we're going to have less time in the kitchen etc it was going to be very convenient um it was going to be a real game changer in terms of the world unfortunately you know what it is perpetuated is this kind of make use throw society and you know in the 1950s you know about two million tons of plastic were being produced um by 2018 it's up to 359 um, i'm still waiting to see this sort of 2019 kind of data but you get the idea and unfortunately the amount of waste and mismanaged waste has gone up proportionally to that so around cut of estimate around 11 percent of waste will end up in the ocean every year and we need to start thinking about this as a kind of global problem and i should sort of say that the marine conservation society data um, we do send it to Ocean Conservancy that brings all the data from around the globe together. And it's really important, you know, if we're thinking about, well, what happens to our waste? Where do we export it to? We need to be thinking of kind of the global. If we don't have the facilities to deal with it, are we sending it to a country that also, you know, perhaps has even worse facilities to deal with it? And therefore it's getting lost into the ocean, into the environment. So that's really important when we think about that. And we shouldn't just think about sort of big bits of plastic. We should also be thinking about um, microplastics. So here are some sort of examples of microplastics. Microplastics are, are less than five millimeters in size. Um, for those the sort of scientific background, often people sort of say, well, micron is less than one and, and it becomes because of these pre-production pellets. Um, you can see these, these are the sort of white little pellets in there. The black ones are something used in the sewage work treatments. And what we can see is those are kind of escaping into the environment as well. And these are really um, easily bioavailable. So we also need to be doing something about those. And I'll come to those at, towards the end of my presentation. So um, hopefully this video will now play. Um, I hope you guys yeah, will get to see this. So these are some zooplankton. And what you can see, this is a microfiber blue and the uh, pink that you can see. And these are actually um, ingesting this. This is the blue thing you can see. And, you know, I was talking about the sort of impact that this has. And these are really the base of the food chain in terms of what happens. So, you know, if the zooplankton are getting, you know, um, this feeling that they've eaten and um, satated, um, they're not going to be then sort of being able to get all the the food and, and nutrition, et cetera. So they're gonna have much higher mortality rate, much poorer reproduction rate, et cetera. So we really need to kind of tackle it all across the board. So what does the Marine Conservation Society do? Well, we've been doing beach cleans for over 25 years. Um, we sort of are the basis of the how data started in terms of doing OSPAR, which is sort of um, Northeast Atlantic seaboard countries and uh, that went on to then form kind of eu legislation uh, through the marine strategy framework directive so we've got a very long history of doing these so this is um how it's done it's done a sort of 100 meter section we collect everything and then this is um it might be a bit small on your screen but um, i'm happy to provide this afterwards um this shows kind of the detailed um survey form and these are really categorized into things that you know an average citizen would understand so you know it has a drinks bottle for example drinks can um you know a, a drinking straw etc so the the idea is that you know an average person can do it and these cleans are led by sort of um you know sort of volunteer experts who sort of help and, and support um perhaps those slightly less experienced volunteers 
So that's really good and we can get that data in, but then we can start analyzing it. And I think this is where, you know, the power of the data really uh, helps to change kind of policy. So this is uh, data going up to 2019. I'd say our result for 2020 literally came out on Friday. So there's a couple of slides in there, but not very much. Um, but what you can see is the kind of top 10 items, for example, and we can start to sort of look, well, what measure should we be doing? Um, why are these items so significant? And we can see sort of regional we can uh, variation. Uh, this sort of shows variation across the sort of devolved nations, but we can also do it by kind of region as well. And we're also able to kind of split it down into sort of different types of litter source. Um, you can see here that we've got sort of public, the non-source is kind of little bits of plastic typically. So basically where we can't identify where it originated from that, you know, it's too degraded, etc. Um, so sadly that makes up quite a large proportion, um, but we can see those other things uh, coming on. So this is our results for the kind of 2020. Um, so yeah, it's a very quick summation. Uh, normally we have a lot more volunteers, um, but due to government regulations this year because of COVID, people could only do their surveys within their bubbles. Um, so this typically was a kind of family group or a kind of equivalent. So we had a lot less uh, volunteers out, um, but we still had a, a large number of events. We also did um, for the first time inland cleans um, because of the, the restrictions on people traveling to the beach and the coast but we're still able to kind of have a look so you know for instance we found 30 drinks containers per 100 meters so providing evidence and i will talk a little bit about some of the evidence and how we use that to, in a little bit so we're also able to adapt the survey to look at kind of emerging issues so um PPE sort of things like masks, um, um, yes, um, antibacterial um, wipes, things like this. We're able to kind of put in as new kind of categories um, under this to sort of show, okay, actually things change in terms of the things that people are littering and we need to have new um, legislation or new sort of campaigns to really try to address this. So this is kind of the, the top five um, for 2020. Um, so you can see that we have a significant problem when it comes to kind of cigarette stubs and also with caps and lids. So at the moment, um, as a Marine Conservation Society, we're using this evidence to say that, you know, we need to see tethered lids uh, to bottles, but also that we need a deposit return scheme. Typically the lids float and the bottles sink. Um, so what tends to, what we think generally is that the caps and lids are probably reflective of the amount of bottles that are typically lost as well. Um, obviously, you know, occasionally people do lose those separately, but again, it provides kind of value and understanding of what's happening. So I think, you know, what we can see from kind of the data is also that we're able to get out in terms of um, getting that to the press and getting sort of coverage. So even those that people that weren't involved in the beach can do this. So this is just a couple of uh, clippings from different um, uh, newspapers, um, online sources. So it's got the BBC, uh, The Guardian, Sky News. And what we can sort of see is kind of a key message that obviously um, PPE was, you know, a new item this year and, uh, you know, and, and a huge increase in the amount um, that understandably was found. And I think this is really important because we're able to kind of quantify and use that to address issues through legislation and through businesses. So it's not just the people on the beach sort of saying, oh, well, I found this, I cleaned it up this time, only this time. And then they go back a week later and they clean it up again. And then they go back a week later and they clean it up again. It doesn't solve the problem if all you're doing is cleaning up. It comes in faster than the people can clean it typically. So we need to look at how that can help and drive kind of using the citizen science data to show evidence and also it starts to garner support. People can see that people are going out. And I think it also changes that responsibility from someone else should clean it up to actually we should be stopping at source. And that's a really important message. You know, if people understand actually it's not responsibility of someone else to pick it up. It's a responsibility of my society not to be dropping it in the first place. And how do we achieve this? So things like um, 
uh, our data fed into the single use plastic directive and um, so this is a bit of legislation i should caveat that uh, the, the uk is leaving the eu um, but we're hoping to replicate much of this legislation um, but you can start to see sort of things that where certain items were banned on the basis of the beach litter data. Um, certain items had uh, costs attached to them in terms of extended reduced responsibility, or things where um, also businesses had to um, will or oh, sorry will have to um, raise awareness in terms of correct disposal by their by their customers basically. So it looks very much at sort of putting the responsibility back on those producers rather than just sort of say okay people shouldn't litter we're now trying to understand well actually how do we get people not to be doing that one of the options is that material is not available the other option is we start to look at what the waste hierarchy uh, involves so we look at the kind of waste hierarchy we really need to be thinking about sort of this focus on kind of reuse if somebody has something they reuse again and again and again I can guarantee I won't find it littered on the beach. You know, things that people value don't get littered. And I think that's a really important thing. Plastic gets littered typically because it's cheap and we don't attach a value to it. And therefore it's quite often kind of just disposed of poorly um, and isn't recycled either because it has low economic value or it's just not getting into the right place in the first place. So, you know, things like uh, this, where we can, um, you know, this is sort of drinking stations, and this can be, you know, something available either sort of in a public place, or I've actually seen a system in France uh, where they provided sparkling water, you know, for a very small fee, so people could kind of top up. And I think, you know, that's really important because it's um, reducing the amount of energy, um, it's reducing the amount of resources that are required, but it's still fulfilling the function of what people want, i.e. they want drinking water available when they're out and about in a kind of clean and efficient way. And, you know, I think on top of that, when we are starting to think about, you know, I talked about our results this year, um, we still found 30 drinks containers per 100 metres. Um, we need to kind of, we can use that data to sort of say, actually, if we attach a, a charge, um, or in this case, a deposit um, for a drinks container, people won't be littering it because regardless of culture, I think pretty much everybody, you know, understands that if this thing that I've got left in my hand has a value, they're much more likely to, you know, take that back and get that money back. And I think that's really important, you know, as consumers, you know, we you know, effectively when we finish drinking our drink, um, you know, it, it, it has zero value to us at that moment, but if we know it still has a value and we can understand that in an easy to understand why I, you know, it has a deposit on it, then we're much more likely to return it. So I think, you know, we can use the Beach Watch data also to show that um, these charges are effective. So this is um, a five pence charge that was applied um, in England to carrier bags in 2015. And what we can see is um, that absolutely we had a kind of massive impact in the number um, that was um, purchased, well, given out and then purchased. And you can see that kind of massive drop happening over sort of 80%. But we can also track that in terms of the beach clean. So we can show that legislation has an impact on the environment. So showing people that actually what they've supported means that it has an environmental impact, positive outcome. And you can see that decrease um, in the number that we're finding in the environment. And that's, I think, a really important message to kind of get out to support us when they're doing the beach clean, that the data is used, it's providing evidence, it's supporting legislation, it invokes change, and the change then can actually show effect. So I've got just a couple of minutes, um, so I'm going to do just a very quick kind of whistle-stop tour about microplastics, um, because we can also do um, citizen science looking at microplastics. And this is work that um, we do with a partner organization, FIDRA. So these are the, the, these very small, uh, less than five millimeter bits of plastic. And sadly, these are lost to the environment. And the pre-production pellets are basically what 
uh, are melted down to form things like, you know, pretty much most plastic products. And they're an easy way to kind of transport plastic around. You can do it in flakes or you can do it in powder, but they have a much higher risk of being inhaled. And, you know, you're going to have the impact of that. So, you know, if we're going to track that, you know, it's really important. And this is sort of showing, OK, you know, actually they make up about 0.5 uh, million tonnes going into the environment. So they are a significant component. And actually, in terms of pellets, they're a relatively easy one to stop. So we can actually use it to kind of, you know, we can distinguish what these look like. Um, I'm just going to skip over this, but it's in the presentation if you're interested. Um, and, you know, I think it's really important um, that we're actually able to kind of um, look at all those kind of sectors that are impacting on that. So what can we do in terms of the citizen science? Well, this is a UK nurdle map. So these are the pre-production pellets. What you can see is quite a lot of collection sites um, across um, Europe and um, able to look at how many nurdles that they collect. I did have a look um, to see if there was any around Kuwait in terms of people going out. Uh, sadly, uh, there's not. So I definitely put it out there um, for anybody that's interested. Um, it would be great if you could join the kind of nurdle hunt and do that. Um, and I spoke to also Fidra, who said um, if anybody's sort of um, able to do some translation to Arabic, that would also be particularly welcome. Um, so. I'm conscious of kind of time, um, but I think that's pretty much me. So thank you very much for your attention and I hope um, you enjoyed my presentation. Uh, thank you, Dr. Laura, for a wonderful and talk. Uh, let's hope people join that program and hopefully someone will take the lead from there. Um, I would like to remind everyone that the three days of webinar series will be available on KFAS's YouTube channel in the coming days. I also kindly request to help us out by filling out the feedback questionnaire at the end of today's series. Next, I would like to welcome Professor Martin Charter. Uh, Professor Martin Charter is the Director of the Center of Sustainable Design at the University for Creative Arts in UK since 1996. He has worked at the director level on business sustainable issues in consultants in con consultancy, leisure, publishing, training, events, and research for over 25 years. Previously, he has held roles as the Launch Director of Greenleaf Publishing and Marketing Director at the Earth Center, and also was a former Director of Regional Business Network focused on sustainable business, green electronics, and eco-innovation. As a Director of the Center of Sustainable Design at the University for Creative Arts, he has led a range of international, national, and regional research consultancy and training programs focused on product sustainability and sustainable innovation. He has an H index of 28 as calculated by Google Scholar and his papers have been re received over 4,400 4, citations. So next is Professor Martin Charter. Uh, sorry i can't be with you here today uh but uh fortunately i've had a uh, bereavement in the family so uh, anyway I, I thank you very much for the opportunity to speak and i hope you have a, a great uh session today my name is professor martin charter um from uh uca in the uk and uh I'm going to give you a bit of an overview around circular business models, circular design related to uh, uh, to fishing gear. And this builds on a project we're involved in, uh, two projects we've been involved in around the area. So uh, as in Google Trends, we see circular economy as a term increasingly uh, used in search engines over the last uh, you know, eight or so years, and really, circular economy. You know, it, it is the essence of circular economy is looking at the sort of bio system and the technical system. And as we know, uh, really, over the last sort of 40, 50 years, uh, fishing gear has moved very much towards uh, the technical system and, and polymers. Uh, but uh, there are broader issues emerging with uh, ocean marine plastics. We may see more innovation in the area. So 
if we're going to move or we're going to transition to the circular economy, we need to design for the circular economy. And 80% of a product's environmental impact is determined at the design and development stage. So in the design and uh, development and assembly of fishing gear, that design uh, stage is, is very important. Uh, but to me, uh, what designing for a circular economy is about is very much about maximizing the value in products, components, and materials for as long as possible in the economic and social systems. So it's about value retention, value maximization, and it isn't about waste. So it's really about an extended life cycle perspective um, and really much more of a focus on the use phase, uh, getting material back, uh, revaluing it, if you like, and then, uh, and then uh, getting it back out into a second or, or end life. What we've seen uh, emerge uh, is various policies worldwide, and particularly in Europe, we had the Circular Economy Action Plan 1.0 uh, in December 2015. We recently had a, a second uh, Circular Economy Action Plan, but this particular one, uh, set in place uh, a variety of uh, initiatives, uh, particularly uh, on uh, of note is, is on plastics. And we saw the emergence of the Single Use Plastics Directive in 2019. And within that, there were uh, proposals uh, for an extended producer responsibility scheme uh, for fishing gear across the 27 countries of Europe. So effectively, uh, for gear manufacturers, uh, assemblers uh, to take back and recycle nets. And that is presently in, in development uh, and, and will move forward. What we've also seen is the coming out of the European standardization system uh, at a SEN is the development of a uh, standard a uh, guidance standard on the circular design of fishing gear. And this process will start uh, next year. On a broader level, we have ISO TC323, uh, which is a technical committee within ISO that is charged with developing uh, standards across uh, the area of circular economy. And we have four in development at the moment, one covering terms and definitions, and a framework, a uh, second one on business models, a third one on measurement metrics, and a fourth one uh, providing guidance through case studies. And I'm involved in that, so I'm aware of the complexity of this. So getting back to the issue of fishing gear, well, we have a, a design problem. Um, we still have extensive waste uh, in the area with a lot of uh, materials going to landfill, uh, particularly polyethylene and polypropylene. Um, and we also have fishing gear going into the sea. Uh, uh, and, and the estimates are between 10 and 70% uh, of ocean marine plastics are, uh, are fishing gear. And, and the European Commission have gone for around about 28 30 percent as their focus but this again is an area uh, that needs a lot more research and organizations like the global ghost gear initiative are uh, trying to penetrate the data here so the idea is to move from that waste system to a much more value-based system or uh, where we 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 organize uh, the materials in materials banks and we extend the value in those materials. We looked at this in a product, uh, in, a, in a report, um, uh, looking at the whole idea of circular business models and circular design. And this was published uh, in May and then uh, revised uh, in July. And this is available from our website. So fin and shellfish, often people think of, of fin uh, fin fish only, but there's also thinking about uh, fishing gear for fin fish and shellfish.
And coming out of our report, we found there was a number of issues that were of a particular importance, particularly in the design and development of the of the fishing gear. You know, essentially, you know, um, the the gear has to be fit for purpose and it has to perform its function to catch fish. Uh, there's a lot of concern from the, uh, uh, the the fishermen, in effect, about the costs of the nets. So any um, you know, keep fishing gear has to be cost effective. Uh, you know, it has to be durable and long life. And uh, presently, uh, the vast majority of fishing gear uh, is made of uh, polymers, but uh, it also includes a whole range of other materials. And uh, Plastics Global quoted that they found through their recycling efforts, there are 700 something like 700 combinations and permutations of materials used in fishing gear. So they're quite complex products, include metals, uh, you know, uh, cork, um, et cetera, et cetera. So another key issue is customization. What we found was a lot of the fishing gear is customized to the needs of the fishermen. So the fishing gear producers work closely with the gear manufacturers. Uh, but what we found is a lot of the product life extension is, is undertaken uh, directly by the fishermen themselves. So actually in the use phase. Other key issues are if particularly if we're going to move towards more circular fishing gear is the uh, how one engages with the supply chain on the these issues that is this is often uh, you know in, in Asia. And another key issue is is recognizing there are different failure modes, you know, different reasons why products come uh, you know in, in effect to the end of the first life. So again, as mentioned before, what we found that, that there is a substantial amount of repair and modification going on within the fishermen in the sense they are wanting to sweat their assets. You know, the fishing gear costs a lot of money, so they want to keep that material going. One of the issues, however, that we did find is that in the repair process or the modification, that often different types of twine are used um, to uh, repair the net, but aren't necessarily consistent with the original material. So this can create a problem um, at the end of the first or second life, or third life, whatever. And what we found was that there are some closed loop models out there where fishing gear uh, manufacturers and assemblers are offering to take back, offering to take back and repair uh, products and resell um, either direct or within a service contract but also in the open loop there are there is fishing gear sort of in the market that is then being reutilized in, in other forms still quite small scale um, and, and a, a report that we completed a couple of years ago now that we're updating indicating that there was maybe about 30 commercial products that we found worldwide um, that are derived from fishing gear in another form. Um, however, I believe that is is, is now growing. So the, 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 those types of products would break down into uh, a couple of areas. So there'll be reused products. So this is Verdura who reuse uh, nets into shoes and these shoes selling for two to 250 euros. As a designer and an entrepreneur, uh, and there is uh, again, uh, this is reutilizing uh, the ropes for, uh, in effect, uh, you know, jewelry uh, for necklaces, etc. It's a German company, and then something I called Regen, which is the use of chemical recycling um, to regenerate. Um, uh, nylon from fishing gear and we have a company called Aquafil who developed a brand called Eco Nile. They use a de and repolymerization process to produce fibers uh, from uh, the fishing gear that is going into clothing, that is going to carpets, etc. And then we also have mechanical recycling uh, and 
particularly of note is uh, Plastics Global, but there are a few small players uh, emerging uh, who use mechanical recycling but to produce pellets uh, for injection molding um, into products. And uh, perhaps one of the best examples is uh, Burio, who are a Chilean uh, US company who uh, have their own process where they work closely with the fishermen and they have a factory in Santiago where uh, by they, uh, you re, you know, they, they utilize um, uh, you know, pellets in injection molding into skateboards and other products. They've tried to aim for 100% utilization of material for the fishing gear, but effectively uh, they had to include rubber uh, in the product because if you drop the skateboard it would break so there are constraints um, in, in, in product development there but they're effectively uh, taking products forward from fishing gear. There's also um, uh, companies who've been experimenting with 3D printing using, um, uh, using filament from fishing gear and uh, we have one company in Cornwall in the UK called Fishy Filaments and their, their, their business is not to produce a 3D printed products, but produce the filaments for 3D printing. And these are coming from, I believe, Second Life Nylon. Um, so there's a, there's a range of different uh, opportunities to start to more uh, fully utilize um, fishing gear um, in, in the open loop into other products. And in, you know, also in summary, if you are a fishing gear producer and assembler, you know, one area to look at is, is maybe your, your business model. So, you know, your company approach or organization approach to deliver value to customers and other stakeholders. And, you know, in, in, in composing business models, um, there are various elements to this. Uh, much easier to create, for example, a more circular business model if you are a small company or a startup. More difficult if you have embedded systems um, and, and larger. But you might want to think about, you know, uh, models that are producing, you know, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, nets on demand, pure customization. Uh, much better use of materials, uh, much more efficient, uh, uh, you know, production. Various uh, product life extension models, uh, you know, t uh, you know, and services. So, you know, like the Vajura example, reutilizing the fishing gear uh, into uh, into fibers for clothing, etc. Uh, but you, one also might look at the whole services around product life extension, uh, you know, from maintenance, uh, from servicing, cleaning, uh, etc. One also might think about remanufacturing models. So if you're a producer assembler, could you modularly de design your, your nets in a more gear in a modular fashion? that the end of first life, if part of the net gets uh, torn or ripped, you can remove that section uh, and, and replace it. So the net goes back to the, to the factory um, and, and then elements of the net are, um, you know, uh, you know re removed and, and new modules in that sense are, are, are incorporated. So that requires a whole company, but also a new design system. There are many models for remanufacturing in other sectors. Could you look at uh, a model that is more based on the functional, uh, you know, providing the function directly to the customer? So selling the service rather than the physical product. So selling, for example, maybe the service of fishing gear is to uh, you know, develop a maximum, uh, you know, capture of, of, of fin or shellfish. So how can you deliver um, a, a service, um, you know, to fulfill that function? And that may be a service through a service contract like rental or leasing, or it may be, uh, you know, paying for the use of the net in some form. 
Um, and this can become much more customer orientated and potentially more resource efficient. And also come and look at collaborative models. So, so maybe, you know, um, in the fishing sector, there are cooperatives and other social enterprises. So, you know, is there a, a, an approach whereby, you know, the fishermen could share and more fully utilize nets um, if, if they're not fishing at the same time. So another key element to think about if we're going to try and move towards or transition towards a more circular uh, approach to you know fishing gear is to look at the whole innovation system around port port cities, of which there are various stakeholders. And uh, one of the areas that we've been looking at and and uh, developing some demonstrations is uh, is the idea of bringing together the innovation subsystems in ports and the fishing subsystems. So these are the role players, you know, uh, who are involved in innovation in cities or port cities and those that are involved with fishing gear. We developed a, a methodology to, to look at that. Uh, and so the idea is then to start to bring those groups together to create, you know, new innovation, because what we found is that those groups really don't talk to one another. The fishing uh, system is also very separate and, and even slightly separate from the port, you know, uh, outside of the main part of the city so we've we've run workshops uh, bringing together and utilize this methodology in Alison in Norway and in Galway in Ireland and surprise surprise when we ran these workshops um, we were quite pretty well attended and it was for the first time that many uh, people had, had met um, and what we started to identify particularly in Ireland is that there were gaps in the value chain so um, in, in the idea of taking, you know, the waste fishing gear to products, there were gaps in terms of role players that needed to be filled. So as part of our thinking, the, you know, conceptually, we've come up with this idea of the BCE lab. This might be a, a, is, is a physical building, you know, that might exist in a port city area that brings a lot of this thinking together. And really, it's a poor, you know, it really starts to tackle the whole idea of uh, the different elements of the value chain from the collection of the materials, the sorting, uh, the, the, the process of shredding, cleaning, etc., grinding, washing, then the, then the you know, manufacture from that uh, material or assembly re reuse through to product. So that whole value chain. So this uh, BCE lab would coordinate this. And there would be four modules within the BCE lab. And this might be one physical building, it might be four buildings, or even there was some discussion in, in a region. And there would be different uh, functions uh, here. You know, there'll be a design lab that's, uh, you know, is, is coming up with ideas from products from the fishing gear. There'll be a processing lab that deals with the, you know, the processing from the cleaning through to the grinding, uh, et cetera you know, in the pelletization um, or, or uh, you know, filament production or just cleaning for reuse. A manufacturing section, you know, that would choose and assemble the products and a, and a startup lab for the, for companies um, who, who produce products from the, from, the, uh, from the waste fishing gear or end of first life fishing gear or second. And so there'd be four components. So again, they might be in one place, but they might be separated. And often as you find, as you generate ideas, you know, in life, no ideas are new. Um, so we found in Sontanus in uh, uh, the southwest of Sweden, there is already some experimentation going on in that uh, area, uh, looking at industrial symbiosis around the, the fishing sector. And they've started to look at, you know, could they create uh, products from uh, from the recycling of waste fishing gear, uh, and uh, you know, uh, similar to what we are thinking about. So that's it's already starting to happen there. So thank you very much for your attention, and I wish you a good conference. So again, it's thinking about value and not waste. How can we maximise the, wa the, the value of the materials and components in waste fishing gear? So thank you very much and have thank a good event. Uh, we thank uh, Professor Martin, who unfortunately couldn't be with us today.
to uh, special circumstances. I am sure after this talk, the ladies will be diving for nets to make shoes now, hopefully, and the men too, of course. Uh, I remind and encourage everyone to ask our speakers questions in the chat, where they will be marked and answered in the Q&A uh, Q panel at the end. Next, I would like to, pro to welcome Professor Stuart, uh, Stuart Barnes. Professor Stuart Barnes is the Chair in Marketing at King's Business School. He joins King, King's College London in September 2015, having held a chair position at other universities since 2005. He gained his PhD from Manchester Business School. His research has involved collaboration and engagement with many types of businesses and government and has been widely publicized, including a keynote speaker and report writer for the European Parliament. Professor Barnes is the founder and director of consumer and organizational digital analytics with, within King's Business School, where he focuses on innovative methods and technology to provide novel solutions to businesses and sustainable problems. Professor Barnes has been involved with many other complex multidisciplinary international research projects and grants, including recently with Saudi Arabia to manage the safety of massive crowds focusing on visitors to Mecca during Hajj, and with also in China, Turkey, Sweden, and also a co-I on a KFAS grant with Dr. Richard Drutchers of Australian College of Kuwait and Brett Lyons of CFAS on understanding the attitudes towards plastic consumption in the Gulf countries. Professor Barn has published five books, one uh, which is a bestseller, that, uh, that have been translated into, into multiple languages, and more than 200 sc scholarly articles that have been cited more than 14,000 times. Professor uh, Barnes, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'd like to talk about some economic aspects of plastic pollution. Uh, and research from a, a couple of papers that I recently had published, one in global environmental change and uh, the other in environmental pollution. Uh, the schedule for my uh, presentation. So to begin with, I'll talk briefly about global plastics pollution as a problem. Obviously this has been touched on before, so I won't spend too much time on that. Then I'll move on to the notion of an environmental Kuznets curve plastic waste uh, and uh, the testing and findings related to that for the very first time. Then I'll focus on the impact of plastic waste exports on consumption, which is going to be the main focus of the presentation today. Talking about um, the research question for that piece of research, the theory and hypotheses that were used, uh, the method, the results, uh, conclusions, and then we'll talk about some directions for future research. Now, as Laura has already pointed out, um, plastics have been widely available since the 1950s. However, the, the, the production of plastic waste in, in recent years has accelerated, more than doubling between 2000 and uh, 2015. Packaging, much of its single use has, has, has been mentioned as responsible for around half of plastic waste generation. However, it's not just single use plastics, there, there are many other sources, of course, we've, we've seen about um, fishing gear, but clothing in, in, in itself is, uh, you know, textiles is a, is a source of plastic waste, consumer products, construction materials. I recently had some, uh, some ele electrician working in my house and was shocked to see how much plastic waste went into the dustbin as a result of that. Um, and, and transportation, too, uh, has a lot of plastic waste. These aspects don't appear to be getting as much attention as packaging. Obviously, plastic packaging, you know, is, is the dominant area here in, in the graph, the, the blue at the bottom. But there are other types of plastic waste that also need attention. Now, plastic waste pollution uh, is a problem shared by everybody. Uh, this is um, a study by Ericsson uh, published in, in PLOS One in 2014. It shows the extent of mar mar marine litter pollution by uh, measurement, uh, a lot of measurements that were put into this and in oceanographic modeling. Now, because it's a problem shared by everybody, it's not just my problem or your problem. And if we don't have coordinated efforts, we have what economists refer to as a tragedy of the commons. Now, a tragedy of the commons effectively is a lose-lose situation 
where everybody does nothing because they think the problem is somebody else's. Now, as we've heard from, from, from Laura and others, plastics degrade over time due to environmental conditions. They become smaller and smaller particles and they become absorbed into ecosystems uh, and uh, within, within uh, you know, marine animals and so on. In this chart here, we have, the, we have microplastics. Uh, the top two are microplastics, 0.33 to one millimeter. And in the bottom we have, uh, uh, we also have 1.101 and 4.75 included as microplastics. In the bottom we have meso and macroplastics. So uh, 4.76 to 200 millimeters and greater than 200 millimeters. As we can see there, there are high densities of marine litter around the globe. We have these two bands stretching across the globe. Uh, they're particularly high, you know, um, around uh, around Asia, but they're also very high in, around um, the Mediterranean and the Gulf area. You can see there in, in, in red. Now, the, we've seen that there's an escalating problem of uh, plastic production and waste. Many countries, including high income countries, have poor levels of recycling. Traditionally, excess plastic waste has been exported to other countries to deal with, or it's been put into landfill, or it's been burned. Uh, a, a lot of these exports, including from, you know, including from the UK, where I'm based, uh, have been to low income countries with a poor record of environmental protection. And nearly half of that plastic waste until 2017 has been imported into China. Um, in 2017, China banned that practice, the, the, the practice of, of, of importing consumer plastic waste. Unfortunately, a lot of those countries that have, have been uh, importing and processing the waste have, have poor plastic waste management. And as a result, there have been detrimental effects on the environment. It's leaked into the environment in those areas. Uh, I, I visited, for example, recently countries such as um, Vietnam and, and Indonesia, and, and there's burning. In, in Vietnam, for example, burning plastic waste in some areas ha has created levels of toxicity greater than Agent Orange. And, uh, you know, you have similar problem in Indonesia. I've seen where plastic waste uh, centers are on the, are on the coast and the plastics, what plastic pollution leaks into, into, the, uh, into the water. Not good. And some of that plastic waste in those countries has been traced back to uh, developing, developed countries like the UK and, um, you know, and countries have now refused to have this waste. This begs the question of whether there might be uh, a relationship between plastic pollution, plastic waste, and economic development, uh, whether there's an, what's referred to as an environmental Kuznets curve for plastic pollution that's been shown for many other types of environmental degradation. Now the Kuznets curve refers to an environmental U-shaped relationship between plastic waste and income per capita. And uh, in fact, uh, in, in recent research, we were able to demonstrate uh, in a paper on environmental pollution that there is in fact uh, an, an inverted U-shape, an, an environmental Kuznets curve for plastics pollution, plastics waste, mismanaged plastic waste particularly. So we contend that exporting plastic waste, local pollution and plastics consumption are related. Further, we assert that exporting plastic waste from a local environment reduces perceptions of local waste mismanagement in an area which indirectly influences consumers to purchase more plastic products. So the research question for this piece of research I'm gonna talk about now is, does exporting plastic waste from a country to improve a local environment indirectly influence plastics consumption? And to try and uh, explain differences according to whether plastic waste is perceived uh, you know, in a local environment, we use construal level theory, uh, a relatively recent theory. And construal level theory suggests that different uh, perceptions 
are, 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 are made by uh, individuals according to whether uh, something is uh, distant or, or close, proximal. Now, particularly, it suggests that uh, there are concrete perceptions if waste is proximal, if it's close, if it's perceived to be around somebody, and more abstract perceptions if plastic waste is distant. And distance can be in, it measured in different ways. It can be distant in time. It can be something that happens at some point in the future. It can be distant in space. Plastic waste could be somewhere else, could happen somewhere else. Maybe it's, it's distant, distant uh, in terms of being social distance. It happens to other people. It doesn't happen to us. They are, they are the people that you know, suffer plastic pollution or unlikely to happen. So that's hypotheticality. So uh, in this study, we test four hypotheses and they're the four hypotheses so hypothesis one put bluntly suggests that the more plastic waste we export the less there is in the country to become mismanaged that's hypothesis one in a nutshell hypothesis two in a nutshell is uh, the more plastic waste that is perceived within a country um, the more consumers will seek to reduce their consumption of plastic. So if they see waste around them, they'll try to reduce. I think that's so bad. That's bad. And we'll try and reduce uh, our consumption of plastics. Hypothesis three uh, suggests that we've got no reason to expect that uh, exporting plastic waste will directly affect from a country will directly affect consumption within a country. Whereas hypothesis four, and this is the key hypothesis uh, based on uh, construal level theory, is that um, there'll be an indirect effect between plastic waste exports and consumption. So exporting plastic waste improves the appearance, the appearance of plastic waste in a local area. And this in turn encourages further plastic consumption, a kind of out of sight, out of mind. So by exporting plastic waste, we're compounding the problem. People think an area is clean, they don't think there's a plastic problem, and they continue to consume more plastics. So for this study, um, the, the analysis was conducted using Smart PLS, uh, which is a variance maximization uh, structural equation modeling program. And we used, uh, we used single item constructs. And the variables were, were as follows. There are single item constructs measuring Average annual plastic consumption from 2011 to 2015 in kilograms per person. Average annual net plastic waste exports from, from 2005 to 2009. Mismanaged plastic waste, that was a very rare data set and that was the most difficult data to get. That was from a study by Jambeck, that includes Gaia et al as well. Um, average income per capita uh, was used as a control variable in our study. Now, our final match data set was uh, 40, 49 countries, all told. So just a, a brief look at our um, plastic consumption. So here we, here we have our sample with average plastic consumption from 2011 to uh, 2015. As we can see, although plastics consumption per capita is, uh, is led by high income countries, they're the blue bars here, when we take income into consideration, the pattern includes many more fast growing developing economies with lower incomes. That's the red line here in the chart. And you see Kuwait there, although Kuwait, Kuwait has uh, you know, a relatively high plastics consumption per capita, it falls considerably uh, when, uh, when we can take into consideration income. Okay, so this is a result of testing our structural equation model. And we see that um, hypothesis one, so this is the relationship between the exporting of plastic waste and proportion of mismanaged plastic waste, had very strong support in our model. Uh, it was supported at the 0.1% uh, level of significance. Hypothesis two, and it's, as we expected, it was a negative relationship. Uh, hypothesis two was also supported as expected, a negative relationship with a coefficient of 0.463, and it was supported at the 5% level of significance. Hypothesis three, uh, as expected, we found no relationship between the export of plastic waste from a country and plastics consumption. And the reason for that is because of hypothesis four. 
So hypothesis four was supported at the, at the 5% level of significance and shows that by exporting plastic waste, a local environment appears artificially cleaner and consumers continue to consume, oblivious to the problem. We have a fully mediated model here. Now, no research is perfect, and there are a number of limitations to, to the study here. So not least, because true lover theory is based on individual psychology, and so in our model, these perceptions are aggregated up. Um, secondly, our study is based on cross-sectional cross data. Unfortunately, you know, there was no data available to do a longitudinal analysis. I wish there was. Uh, there was only you know, a, a rare, a rare set of data for mismanaged plastic waste globally. Um, so uh, in the future, when that becomes available, we hope to be able to do more research in this area. So our research design uh, may not fully capture causality until we, can, until we can get that type of data. And of course, our matched data set for all of our data uh, was only based on 49 countries. In terms of conclusions, the upshot here is that exporting plastic waste is actually a problem rather than a solution. Because as we've seen, it encourages continued consumption of plastics. Uh, as Laura ha has mentioned, solving the problem of plastic waste requires greater understanding and local initiatives to tackle production, consumption, and recycling reuse in a more circular way. Uh, through reduction, reuse, recycling, uh, and you know the notion of this plastic waste hierarchy that uh, that Laura mentioned earlier. Now, as as was mentioned um, very kindly in my introduction, um, we're doing some work with with Kuwait in this area. There's there's particularly there's a, a lack of understanding of the perceptions of consumers regarding plastics consumption and pollution in Kuwait and the Gulf states generally. So we have a, a very small project uh, that's kind of been funded by KFAS. Unfortunately, the, the, the amount has been reduced due to, due to COVID, but we're working, working with, a, with a colleague um, at Australian College of Kuwait uh, and, and Brett at CFAS. And we're going to be examining different perceptions of plastic consumption using text analysis of uh, media data and user generated uh, data, social media data that we're talking about here, uh, social media content. And um, that's, that's going to be ongoing very soon. So hopefully in the future we can share with you some results of that uh, particular study. Thank you for listening. And I hope I've saved a few minutes because I know that the other presentation is over around. But Thank I made you sure so much. I didn't do Thank that. Thank you, Professor Stewart, for the delightful talk. Indeed, you have shed light on some key points. Thank you so much. Uh, next, I would Thank like you. to welcome Dr. Dari Lahuel. Uh, Dr. Dari Lahuel is an avid volunteer diver and serves as an international relations officer at the Kuwait Dive Team, Environmentally volunteer, uh, Voluntary Foundation, where he liaises with international organizations on matters related to marine protection. He works full-time as an assistant professor in the, uh, in the Information Science Department at Kuwait University. Those who know Dr. Dari and follow him on Twitter will know how much he means to our local marine environment. On a regular day, Dr. Dari teaches a lecture in the morning at Kuwait University, then deals with his committees some, somewhere in the afternoon, then goes diving, retrieving sunken vessels and removing large, uh, large size marine litter. I wouldn't be surprised to see Dr. Dari right after this seminar series would go dive to look for something to remove from our seed. So Dr. Dari, the floor is yours. And that was definitely, definitely uh, as agreed, as part of my introduction, uh, that's very kind of you. Uh, thank you. So uh, I'll be speaking on behalf of the Kuwait Dive Team that's uh, part of the Environmental Voluntary Foundation and really just highlighting uh, uh, some uh, key numbers uh, and some key activities and projects that the team has been uh, involved uh, in uh, since its inception. Uh, so the team uh, has over 28 years of marine uh, conservation uh, experience and expertise, uh, and as demonstrated in the slides, really our uh, uh, programs or our projects really uh, span across four major areas. 
So one uh, is about raising awareness and the culture of environmental conservation. The other, uh, uh, you know, the other pillar uh, of our projects really uh, is around protecting the marine environment or rescuing uh, uh, the marine, uh, uh, if you will, uh, uh, organisms, uh, as well as rehabilitating uh, what we have unfortunately lost due, uh, due to various reasons. Uh, through, throughout uh, the, the team's history, we've had about approximately 876 uh, operations and a whopping uh, 5,000 uh, 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 tons of waste lifted. And, the, and I'll go into details. Uh, of, of you know the waste uh, that we've been uh, lifting uh, specifically from the marine environment. Unfortunately, in this talk, uh, we're talking about you know the the waste being lifted, but I'll try to also uh, interject and, and tell you a little bit about you know uh, some of the other um, uh, projects that we're involved in. So, if we look at just the 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 litter and and you know uh, that we've been lifting, uh, whether it's from marinas, whether it's from islands, or from uh, uh, different and various beaches, that amounts to approximately 490 operations uh, and, and amounts to 3.7 thousand uh, tons that has been lifted. Uh, and a lot of times, uh, uh, you know, as you can see in, in some of these pictures, we also try to involve the community, especially the youngsters, because they are the future uh, and, and they are the ones that are more uh, open to change and more open to uh, new messages. So we try to uh, target that. And I think, you know, on purpose, we have uh, shown you all pictures here because a picture uh, speaks a thousand words. Uh, when it comes to, unfortunately, ghost nets or uh, the uh, fishing nets that, have, that are continuously uh, being abandoned by irresponsible uh, fishermen, uh, we have a total of 166 operations uh, with 241 uh, tons lifted uh, of these nets. And it's devastating to see the amounts of um, uh, whether it's fish, whether it's sometimes, unfortunately, if it's on coral reef, uh, the amount of destruction and uh, death that these uh, uh, fishing nets really are causing. And we really, uh, uh, without the collaboration with our various uh, partners, whether that's the Environmental Protection uh, Agency, EPA here in Kuwait, or the Department of Fisheries, or the Kuwait Coast Guard, we really cannot, uh, couldn't have made this happen. And we're on a, um, so if, if somebody were to ask me, uh, I would say approximately once or twice a week, unfortunately, we go uh, out, uh, and mainly in Kuwait's Bay or the uh, coral reefs, uh, and we lift one of these uh, sunken, um, or, or fishing nets, rather. Uh, and, and lastly, uh, the thing that we wanted to highlight in the talk, um, uh, sometimes uh, people refer to us as Team Mission Impossible, <laughs> but uh, uh, lifting 768 vessels or totaling to a thousand, uh, uh, 11,000 uh, tons. Uh, not only uh, are these sunken vessels uh, causing a navigational hazard uh, in Kuwait's waterways, but they're also a huge environmental catastrophe. So we've heard the, the previous fantastic speakers about, you know, the various degrees of marine uh, litter from, uh, uh, you know, large things such as these vessels to medium things, perhaps, you know, the plastic bottles or, or fishing nets. And, and the damage that they cause to microplastics. So hopefully uh, that gives you a good overview of what the team has been involved in. And I look forward to participating more and answering questions. Over to you, Dr. Fang. Thank you for the professor's talk. Uh, next, our speaker is Mr. Sebastian Frisch. Uh, Mr. Sebastian Frisch, uh, one of the managing directors of Black Forest Solutions. And there you are. He holds the responsibility of leading an international waste management consultant, consultancy team of 18 staff. Uh, Mr. Sebastian has 18 years of waste management experience in more than 60 countries, uh, with 12 years of practical experience in extended producer responsibility and the circular economy sector. He is currently leading a project in Kuwait to survey and establish a comprehensive database for a national waste management system. The four-year project is implemented in cooperation with, with the, of, of the Front Royal Institute. The project is conducted on behalf of the Kuwait Environmental Public Authority. Uh, 
In this project, the con consultants proposed concept to support the public sector in, in decision-making, including strat strategies for, ext for extended producer responsibility in Kuwait. Uh, Mr. Frisch, your the floor is yours. Thank you very much um, for having me in this um, e event or this session today. Good, good evening from my side. Um, yesterday there was also a session and I mentioned that, uh, in my opinion, um, what we need in order to, to, call, to, to um, solve the problem of plastic uh, waste uh, littering and marine littering is uh, very important to have the extended producer responsibility that follows the polluter pays uh, principle and that actually um, ensures um, enough funding uh, to build an infrastructure for the collection of uh, plastic waste. So we have um, seen some successful examples where plastic itself um, is not always seen as, as a very bad item, so um, ecologically speaking. Um, and uh, it can be treated in a very efficient way um, if there is enough funding and if there is enough responsibility from the uh, packaging producers. Um, this is one important item. The other one is uh, to also close landfills because uh, as long as there are landfills, um, uh, new technologies and innovations when it comes to plastic recycling uh, and waste management is, is blocked. So these two things I think are the major steps when you think about the, the root cause um, of, of, of this problem, EPR and closure of landfill. Um, when the plastic now reach the ocean, right? So, um, and nothing can be changed anymore at the, at the root cause, but we have to act and we have to deal with the situation. Um, then today I would like to share a few slides um, about our project One Earth, One Ocean, which is actually um, an NGO um, that is funded for the purpose of collecting um, plastic waste in a, in a larger scale once it reached already the, uh, the marine environment. Um, these figures we heard over the last um, uh, three days, um, very scary figures about the quantities and about the lifetime of plastic uh, once it reached um, the landfill or, or the, the marine environment. Um, in our in NGO, One Earth, One Ocean, we are following uh, three uh, divisions. So one is uh, pure cleaning activities um, uh, at the uh, at the ma um, marine environment. It can be um, the, the ocean itself or also um, rivers or, or lakes. We also do research and documentation of, um, of, 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 the, of the activities that we are doing and we do education and information uh, sessions. When it uh, comes to the technical part, uh, we have three different um, models of um, small boats or, or larger vessels. Uh, we call it uh, in, the, in the smallest form sea hamster, uh, then the, the medium form is sea cow, and the sea elephant, which is a large vessel uh, that can actually treat uh, the, the waste that has been collected on the high sea uh, on board. So it has various uh, technologies that um, uh, make sure that there's a recycling happening on board, uh, conversion into oil, uh, com compressing, uh, also thermal use, um, sorting. Of course, all these uh, different um, treatment technologies are on the board of the sea elephant. And for the smaller applications for the sea cow or uh, sea hamster, uh, that, that is more used in uh, rivers and, and inland. Uh, waters. To give you an idea how this looks in reality, so the sea hamster you see here at the left side, um, there we are active with a couple of, uh, of, of these small boats at the moment in different um, areas in the world um, where we are very active is, is the Mekong River in Cambodia um, where several sea hamsters are um, um, employed. Uh, the sea cow is, uh, for example, uh, currently in, in Hong Kong uh, and cleaning the, the shore and the coastal areas. Um, um, so at, at, at the Hong Kong um, shore and um, the sea elephant is not yet uh, built. It's still in a planning phase, uh, 
um, and we completed a, um, a feasibility study in 2019. Here uh, are more pictures. Um, uh, here's one sea uh, cow, for example. And this slide uh, shows you a bit uh, how it actually works. It's collecting marine litter with special nets. Uh, it's sorting the litter into recyclables and non-recyclable products. Um, and also have the, uh, the possibility of cleaning water from oil and chemicals, taking water samples for further analysis. This is what was meant before with uh, documentation. Further pictures, the sea cow in, in action. Yeah, this is, um, as I said, still in, in the planning phase. We hope that either 2021 or 2022, we will be able to also um, uh, have this sea elephant um, in operation. Um, and we are very close in uh, uh, getting the approval for, for funding uh, of, of, this, of this version uh, of, the, of the boat. Um, as I mentioned, there's in, in the sea elephant already different treatment units um, available uh, that can, for example, uh, produce um, RDF, refuse-derived fuel. One of our uh, main uh, partner here when we collect uh, larger quantities of marine litter is the cement industry because you also have to ask the question once you collected it, what happens actually with the collected um, uh, plastic, especially when it is multi-layer plastic and you cannot recycle it. And uh, according to our figures, about 70 to 80 percent actually are multi-layer packaging that cannot be so easily um, recycled. And one option for larger quantities is um, the, the cement industry that takes this waste as an RDF and as a re um, refuse derived fuel. Further pictures. It can be also built uh, locally, by the way. So it is not needed that it must be built uh, in Germany or in Europe. Um, uh, we are very flexible there. We are not selling these boats or these ships. This is not the purpose of this NGO. The purpose is just to clean uh, the ocean. Various slides. Um, yeah, maybe about one, one sentence about one earth, one ocean in, 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 in Brazil, uh, where we just recently started now. Um, we, have, um, we are able there to, uh, to um, complete the whole circle. So from the collection of large quantities at the shore, at the beaches of, of Brazil, uh, we are collecting it and we are preparing it for the further treatment at the cement kiln and um, these um, quantities that are treated in the cement kiln are also offset with so-called plastic offsetting certificates. That's an additional income that we are using, uh, for example, for education and information um, projects that we are um, um, realizing uh, left and right uh, of, of, of our projects. 2020, we also started in Egypt on the River Nile uh, with one uh, sea hamster that is operated by the NGO Very Nile. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm also very open for any uh, questions and follow up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rich, uh, for the lovely concise talk. Uh, now uh, we move to the QA uh, Q panel. Uh, first, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Laura and Dr. Dari to turn on their cameras and microphone for the QA session. And I would also like to remind our audience that uh, in the handout, you'll find uh, the PowerPoints of our speakers tonight. And Dr. Dari. Okay, yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Uh, I'll start with uh, Dr. Laura. Uh, where have we failed in get, getting citizens involved in protecting our environment, do you think, as scientists? How could get, we get them more engaged than they are right now? Sort of think that they aren't empowered to to help and to make a change, um, and I think they sort of think, oh, I, I don't really have an effect for doing this small little thing. Um, and I think you know one of the things that we try to do as an organisation is really to make them feel that actually their kind of their vote, I suppose, for want of a better description, actually counts. Um, that they're actually making a difference, and I think. For us, you know, having this data and collecting this data really helps them understand that they're part of a bigger thing. You know, they're they're a little bit of that puzzle, but actually they can see the value of it becoming something bigger. You know, it's quite a visual representation of it. Um, and I think 
you know, that really helps. And then they sort of, you know, I, I know, for instance, you know, local papers, for example, will pick up on sort of local results and things like that. So people feel engaged with their communities. But I think it's sort of, you know, in terms of the sort of scientific community, there is a lot of emphasis on, well, we're not 100% sure what happens and we're not sure what level is really causing harm at population. I, I think I try and really get a very clear message out there saying this, you know, plastics is a persistent pollutant. It will continue to accumulate as we put it in the environment. It's not biodegrading. And therefore, we need to take every little step we can to kind of diminish them out going in. Okay, uh, there is a follow-up question of um, on a, what, what our audience asked, uh, or Brian Eric, he asked them. Um, here in Kuwait, we have lots of cleaning staff. Uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure that's not in everywhere in the world, but here we do have uh, an excess cleaning staff, let's say. Uh, and the staff usually clean up the beaches. So the question is, uh, do you believe that this would be uh, some sort of luxury for people, that they just abandon their things knowing that someone will pick up after them? I'm sure there's lots of lazy people, unfortunately, in Kuwait that do that. Do you see that being true? I mean, in the UK, where perhaps we don't have that same level of sort of service, let's say, um, that people say, oh, well, someone else will pick it up. And I think, you know, it's about understanding about responsibility and, and sort of people, you know, I talked about a deposit return uh, scheme. You know, people understand the economics and a connection to that and, and therefore that concept that it has a value and that it costs somebody somewhere or it costs the planet somewhere to, to kind of do that and I think having that kind of link um, and I think you know it, it's really sort of going actually you know we're not providing a job for somebody you know I mean that's sometimes what I also hear is oh well I'm providing a job by leaving it there and it's like well actually you know there's lots of other things that we could do with that time or use that resources to, to actually clean maybe the the ocean itself in a kind of a more holistic way rather than just picking up um what for instance one family has left I, I'm sure that I, I, I'm getting good nod about that in terms of cleaning up. Uh, thank you uh, I'll move on to Dr. Dari. Uh, as a diver, have you seen any progress towards uh, looking at the environment? Is it getting cleaner? Is it getting more, uh, getting worse? And what would you say the number one issue uh, facing our waters? Uh, thank you, Dr. Fahed. So uh, as a diver, let me tell you that uh, a lot of times, unfortunately, as we go out to the islands, uh, uh, usually, you know, we would check our GPS or the compass to know if we're headed in the right direction. But uh, uh, when it's, uh, especially during the summer, uh, summer times, and especially if there are no, uh, you know, uh, wind gusts or, or, or even waves, you know that you're in the right direction when you see the trail of plastic or the trail of trash along the way. And you know that you're, you're headed in, in towards the island, unfortunately. Uh, but the good news is because of the unfortunate uh, uh, COVID uh, pandemic and, and what it caused, uh, uh, you know, for us to stay in lockdown and, you know, stay at home, we saw the marine environment, uh, uh, you know, quite honestly flourish, uh, uh, you know, uh, throughout these times because, you know, it was, you know, for all intents and purposes, it was like a, uh, like a, a, a conservation uh, on its own with, without any disturbance. Now, uh, whether you know things are getting uh, better or things are not, I think uh, gradually, maybe not perhaps to the speed that we want it to be, but now we're not seeing a lot of you know island goers or boaters throw their anchors. We're seeing still some, but we're seeing a lot of people you know that uh, would tie off to the mooring buoys that you know we've been involved in. Uh, KFAS has generously and continues to uh, support us on this, as well as the uh, EPA on this particular uh, project. Now, uh, you know, regarding your question in terms of, you know, what is the most, uh, uh, you know, let's say, uh, threats on, on our oceans, I think it's, it's the small, um, uh, it's the small uh, microplastics that, you know, uh, whether intentionally or unintentionally, we're leaving behind or that makes it uh, into our oceans. Because uh, for us, it's easy, well, relatively speaking, right, to go and, and, and pick up uh, uh, some of these, uh, uh, you know, some of this trash or even, you know, volunteers uh, to do that. But it's not so easy. This, this actually brings me to my next question. Um, where are the volunteers at? I mean, are they, because uh, there's a question from the audience by Cure asking, uh, 
uh, do we have any volunteer groups? Uh, are they not getting attention of attention? Are there not uh, much awareness? Uh, where do you think they are? They are? Uh, so I, I think there there are plenty of volunteer groups. I mean, uh, uh, you, you look around, and if you just search on Twitter, uh, uh, just for beach cleanups, just as an example, we have a good uh, amount of, of volunteers that actually go and do that. And, and sometimes, uh, you know, some of these volunteers actually don't even have any social media accounts. They're just a group of people that would, you know, get together and go to a particular uh, beach or a particular location, and, and they do their cleanup. Now. Uh, I think there is uh, support, but I think it's not about just the volunteers, but you know, the volunteers are there. It's not their job. Their job, you know, they have all full-time positions probably somewhere, or maybe they're full-time students uh, somewhere. Uh, and yes, we do have, uh, you know, quote unquote, what you refer to uh, sometimes as a luxury of, of having, you know, uh, some staff to go out and clean our beaches, but really it needs to stop from the people uh, you know, clean up after yourself when you're out there, reduce, reuse, and recycle. Thank you, thank you, Valari. Um, uh, back to you, Laura. Uh, there's a question by Fadia uh, asking, uh, what is the relationship between the marine litter and fish kill? Uh, how substantial is this uh, relationship? To actually kind of quantify, I don't know anybody who's actually come up with a, an answer to that. Um, I, I think the, the, the key sort of thing is perhaps that we know that it's having a negative impact in terms of um, the ability to, you know, for organisms to produce because, you know, effectively they're ingesting it, thinking they're eating food. So I, either, you know, there's a potential mortality at the time, but then there's also, you know, a sort of decrease in terms of sort of health of that population. But I don't know anybody that can actually kind of quantify and say, how much are we getting? You know, people have tried it for ghost gear, uh, which is the most obvious. And even that they kind of struggle um, because there's so many variables. So yeah, sorry, it's a bit of a non-answer. But... Oh, th thank you, thank you for the answer. Uh, okay, uh, now I, th I thank you, Dr. Laura and Dr. Dari for your talks and answers. Uh, next, I would like to invite Professor Barnes and Mr. Frisch. Uh, I can ask to turn on the camera and microphone, please. Uh, thank you. Okay. Uh, for the first uh, question I have, uh, it's by uh, Noor, uh, is about um, the nanoplastics. Uh, this is for Mr. Professor Barnes. Uh, are they prevalent? Uh, based, based on the graph she saw that you presented, Professor Barnes, um, are, are non, uh, nanoplastics uh, prevalent or not? Um, well, generally the top two categories in the, in the uh, slide I show you are, are responsible for 99% of all the plastics that were measured in the oceans. So uh, yes, because they degrade over time. So larger plastics over time become smaller and smaller. So e e even sizes below the, those that were measured uh, in, in those, those graphs are there. But unfortunately, the methods that we have in order to, to, to capture that uh, I, you know, I, I'm not not good. You, it's, they're so small. You can't when you do transects. It's difficult to measure nanoplastics. They're very very small. Thank you. Okay. Um, while reading the chat and the discussion on the chat, um, uh, Maryam pointed out a good a valid point. I thought I would ask Mr. Flesh about it. Uh, the, the, she mentioned that uh, there are no uh, boundaries uh, for marine pollution. Which means that the global society, every in every country and every government, has to work collectively to handle this big issue. I mean, whatever we throw in the sea will will definitely affect other regions. So my question is to Mr. Um, how can we come together collectively? Should the United Nations perhaps take lead in this one? Um, yes, there, there are some some very positive examples already in the world where. Um, countries agreed on, on joint uh, actions and joint activities. Uh, just to name, for example, maybe the, the Basel Convention, which has been ratified by more than 180 countries. Uh, and just recently, a couple of years ago, also plastic and plastic waste uh, is, is now uh, part of this Basel Convention. So, so before it was more meant for the, the transboundary shipment of hazardous waste. Um, but this is, to, to me, one example that there's really hope 
um, that there will be joint joint action uh, between the countries. Um, and as you said, I'm I'm now in this waste management field since since nearly 20 years, and and I and I see it from the optimistic perspective at the moment. So I I do see that the whole awareness uh, on uh, plastic waste, plastic littering, also caused by the marine litter discussion, is really increasing, and that um, uh, we have reached a point of no return. I think where where all the countries cannot go back or they, they have to move forward into the direction of uh, uh, taking action and, and joint and also joint activities. So um, I'm, I'm hopeful and one, one example would be the Basel, Con uh, Basel Con Convention for me. Thank you, Mr. Flesch. Um, question to Professor Barnes. How effective are biodegradable trash bags? And the follow-up question to that is, are, are there enzymes that would help, uh, you know, uh, get rid of these uh, the small microplastics? I mean, I, I believe there is some research in, into the enzymes. There's some research in Japan, I think, recently to, for breaking down. Uh, it's, it's not something I know a great deal about. I know that there are trash bags available and, that, and they're widely used in some places. Um, so that's, that, that's a way to go. I wonder if I could just pick up on, on the point that Sebastian said. So there are some really, really strong NGOs that are helping to pull, pull together activity like the Ellen MacArthur Foundation uh, and the Plastics Pact and so on that, that they've, uh, they've, they've established uh, to eliminate unnecessarily pro problematic packaging, to, mo to move uh, away from single use plastics to reuse, to ensure pa all pla packaging is reusable, recyclable, uh, compostable and so on. Uh, and th they have a lot of uh, very big companies signed up to this now. Uh, and, and in many countries of the world, and in fact, different governments in different countries have signed up, uh, including, you know, in the UK and in Portugal and in, in the Netherlands and the European Union and so on. So there are some very powerful NGOs. Um, yeah, but I, I'm, I'm not a biochemist. So regarding the other thing, I'm, it's not really my area of expertise. Well, well, thank you. Thank you both for your answers. Indeed, we all live in one, one ocean, as Mr. Huish said. Uh, thank you so much for your answers and thank you so much for your talks. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our three days webinar series on marine litter. Uh, that was a collaborative long-term effort between KFAS, CFAS, Kisser, and Kuwait University. I would like to thank the committee who made this webinar series possible. Uh, from KFAS, Dr. Lubna, Dina Naqib, Sar Al Halal, Dan Al Kendiri, uh, from Kisser, Sultan Al Salim, uh, most importantly, Dr. Brett Lyons from CFAS. I would also like to thank the people behind the scenes, the crew behind the scenes, uh, from KFAS Anwar Omar and Shab al uh, The three days webinar series will be available on KFAS's YouTube channel in the coming days. I also kindly request to, to help us out by filling out the feedback questionnaire at the end of the series. Uh, thank you so much for your, for your, for your uh, delightful comments and, and questions, and uh, we wish everybody a good evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>